We have been going through the essentials of our faith. We've been in a series studying what do we believe and why, and defining what we have to agree on. These are the things that if we are going to fellowship together, we have to agree on. And I think some of you are going to be surprised at the things that we cover. I think more of you are going to be surprised at the things we don't. Because we like to make everything that we believe essential. So all of my personal beliefs are essential, and you should believe what I believe. That way lies the Pharisees. Okay? That way lies self-righteousness and judgment. But we do have to have core beliefs that bind us together. In the memory verse from last week, we talked about one body. Why is there one body? Well, because there's one God. There's one spirit. There's one salvation. There's not many bodies. There's one body. It's the body of Christ. There has to be something that holds us all together in unity. And so, we've talked about a number of subjects already. We've talked about the inerrancy of Scripture. That it is God-breathed. It is divine, it is without error, in the original document, in the original form. Now we have some complications because it wasn't written, it wasn't delivered in English. Thankfully, English is a messed up language. Right? Because I love Cheerios, I love my dog, I love my wife. But I don't love them all the same. Because I could very easily do without Cheerios, and I could do only a little less easily without my dog, but I don't want to do without my wife. Okay? English is not a very efficient language. So, we have some complications because we try and take things from their language and interpret the idea in our language so we can understand it. You know, when Paul wrote things in in the Greek and he was handing them out to people that spoke and understood Greek. There are things that he put in there that he didn't have to explain. We read and go, <laughs> what? <laughs> Sometimes it makes me feel inadequate because I don't get it. But that goes back to one body. Remember what else we have? One spirit. See, the same spirit that was indwelling Paul and inspiring him to write God's divine word also dwells in me and takes those passages and sometimes with study, sometimes with just miraculous intervention can make those come alive to me. Sometimes, there are still passages I've been studying for years and I just don't get. I, I just have, they, they've eluded me. Okay? If any of you feels like you've got it all together, nah. let me be honest with you. You don't. Okay? Okay? Let, let's just put that on the table right there. You don't. Okay? Because we're finite people trying to comprehend an infinite God and His infinite grace. Okay? So we talked about the inerrancy of His Word. We talked about the nature of God, the monotheistic idea of one God there has always been, will only ever be, is only one God. There are none before Him. There will be none after Him. There are none beside Him. One God. We even went so far as to study the Scriptures and say, well, all these false gods are not gods. What are they? What does Scripture tell us? If you are not worshiping the one true God... You're worshiping demons. That's, that's what Scripture tells us they are. Demonic powers. Okay? But then we got into the, the thing that really tripped up a lot of the, the Jews in the New Testament. The idea of Trinity. And we studied from Genesis on through. And we see how over and over and over again... God always represented himself as one God, but coexistent, 
co-eternal in three parts. Matter of fact, we looked up several passages where it readily identifies those three parts. There is the Father who sits in heaven. There is the Spirit who indwells man. And there is the Son who came down to earth, took upon the nature of a man, the unique God-man, the incarnation, and bridged the gap between man and God once and for all. Coexistent, they've all always existed, co-equal, none is greater than the other, but we see examples of submission because God to love the world that he sent his son. And we see that the Holy Spirit came at the request of the Son and at the direction of the Father. Does that mean that any of them are less? No. It means they know how it works. It means that they didn't sit up in heaven going, I don't want that job. Pass that off to Jesus. He hadn't done anything good for a while. You know, like we do when we get together in a group and it's time to plunge the toilet. I don't want that job. I'd rather mow the lawn. See, they understand how it works. That's why Jesus passed to us before he left. You want to be great? You want to be great in the kingdom of God? Become a <coughs> Serve others. Live a life of a servant. Do as I have done. So we talked about the Trinity. And then the last time we spoke about this, we were dwelling um, with the second part of the Trinity. Jesus Christ, the God-man. And we talked about the incarnation. And we have uh, this message and one more that I'm, I'm planning on dealing with. Um, we talked about the incarnation, the unique nature of being fully God and fully man. Everybody do it with me now. Come on. Fully God and fully man. All right? It, it'll stick in your head if you do that. Trust me. <laughs> fully God and fully man. Okay? Today we're going to talk about the virgin birth. See, I'm going to read something to you right here because I, I in my studies, I was trying to put down why this is an essential. <clears throat> because believe it or not, there are people that don't believe this is an essential. Okay? I think we have to. And in my studies, I came across a quote that I want to read to you. I think this guy summed it up very well. Okay? Um, so I'm just going to read to you a short passage here. This is Dr. James Orr. And this is out of his, his work, The Virgin Birth of Our Lord. He says, Doctrinally, it must be repeated that the belief in the virgin birth of Christ is of the highest value for the right apprehension of Christ's unique and sinless personality. <coughs> Here is one, as Paul brings out in Romans 5.12, who, free from sin himself and not involved in the Adamic liabilities of the race, reverses the curse of sin and death brought in by the first Adam, and establishes the reign of righteousness and life. Had Christ been naturally born, not one of these things could be affirmed of him. As one of Adam's race, not an entrant from a higher sphere, he would have shared in Adam's corruption and doom, would himself have been required to be redeemed. Through God's infinite mercy, he came from above, inherited no guilt, needed no regeneration or sanctification, but became himself the redeemer, regenerator, sanctifier for all who received him. Now I could just end it right there. Don't get your hopes up. <laughs> because I want to explain what that means. Okay? Because see... Paul makes it very clear in Romans 5 
that because of Adam's sin, all men became sin. All right? There is born in us the nature, not just the propensity to sin, but the nature of sin. We cannot come before God as we are without being rejected. We like to dwell in the love, the perfect, absolute, unconditional, agape love of God. We, we like to dwell on that. And that's absolutely fantastic. But one of the things that we tend to overlook, that we don't dwell with, is the absolute, with the same perfection, His justice, His holiness, His righteousness, His spotlessness. Okay? That He is without blemish. And that even the smallest drop of ink will blemish a white sheet of paper. God rejects sin totally, completely, absolutely eternally. Okay? We need to understand that. Because if we don't understand that, we think there's some way we can come before God without the redemption of Jesus Christ. We think there's something we can do to cover up our own stench and make ourselves a sweet aroma to God. And we can't. There's, there's nothing we can do. So, we're going to take a look. You see, let's, let's flip back to Genesis chapter 3. Let's look at where the problem started. So Adam and Eve are in the garden. Things are going great. Adam is doing the work that the Lord set out before him. You understand that in the garden it wasn't just a party. But work had not yet become a four-letter word. Work was a blessing. The things that God had given Adam and Eve to do were a blessing. God put Adam in charge of all this, all this stuff. Take care of it. It's mine, but I'm putting you in charge of it. Take care of it. Husband it. And then he said, you know what? It's not good that man's alone. I'm going to make him a suitable helper. And he created woman. And things were good. And God put in the garden the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he said, this only I require of you, do not eat the fruit of that tree. Everything else is yours. Do as you will. Then the serpent comes in. We know the serpent to be Satan. He comes in. And he speaks to the woman, he speaks to Eve, and he says, Look at that. Isn't that nice looking food? Oh, God said, Don't eat that. Really? Did he say that? Don't you know why? God doesn't want you eating that because if you eat that, what happens? You will become like God. Now, there was truth wrapped up in a deceitful, dirty lie. Because, see, this is the thing that Satan himself wanted. He wanted to be like God. And now he's promulgating that disgusting philosophy that any created being in any measure could ever be like God. To Adam and Eve. And she looked at the fruit and saw that it was pleasing. And she ate it. Now, quite honestly, I get frustrated with Adam. I want to flick him in the head. <laughs> you realize that Eve was his responsibility, right? <clears throat> you understand that? He was to safeguard her. And yet, there he is, 
sees her eating the fruit and she turns and offers it to him. One, he wasn't there protecting her as he should have. And two, and this is a sin that has haunted men from then to now, he was more interested in pleasing his wife and accommodating his wife than he was in doing what he knew to be right. And he took the fruit and ate it. Now, I understand full well. If Adam and Eve in the garden had been Glenn and Christie, I would have done the same thing. You guys would have been just as hoes. <laughs> I understand that. And the Adam that would be standing up here preaching would want to flick me in the head. Okay, I understand that. This was determined that this was going to happen. This was known that it was going to happen before the world was ever created. Okay? So it doesn't matter whether it's Adam and Eve, or Glenn and Christy, or Jason and Monica. It doesn't matter. <coughs> it was determined that this was going to happen. God knew it. But I want to show you something. Because God comes walking through the garden in the cool of the evening. What part of the Trinity was that? Jesus. It was Jesus, pre-incarnate Christ. And he's walking in the cool of the evening and he can't find out who he is. And he calls out, where are you? Now, do you think God didn't know where he was? I mean, can you imagine anyone burst to play hide and seek with? <laughs> I mean, you don't ever want him to be it. They just said, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You're there, you're there, you're there, you're there. I win. Game's over. All right? So it's not like he was walking through the garden going, I can't find him. Where are you? I think he was issuing a challenge. He was issuing a call. They come out. They're clothed. Jesus asks them what has happened. And the finger pointing starts. Uh, it wasn't me, it was that, that, that. Oh, my baby, it was your fault. <laughs> and the woman goes, I'm like, well, I no, it was the serpent. The serpent did it. Don't we do that? Don't we often come before God with excuses as to our own decisions, our own sin? And we want to blame everybody else. And we want to make it somebody else's fault. So as if in some way that ameliorates the damage that we've done, that excuses us in any way, instead of just coming before him honestly and saying, I, I blew it again. I knew I shouldn't have, and I did. I blew it. So then, God lays down the curses. And he speaks to the serpent. And he curses it. And he speaks to the woman and curses her. And he speaks to Adam and curses him. Now, I personally believe that God was not pronouncing a curse upon them from himself. He was pronouncing the curse that came when they ate the fruit. Okay? I think he was declaring to them what happened because of eating the fruit. You may be mad, I'm going to get you. Okay? So, but I want to read you one thing here. This is the first promise we have of the incarnation what becomes the virgin birth and it's actually a promise of the virgin birth because in verse 15 God says he's speaking to the serpent but he says I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise your heel now the word offspring there some of your translations might say seed the woman's seed now we see the term seed used throughout scripture in, in numerous ways Agriculturally speaking, we also see it regarding the birth of children. But this is the only time in Scripture that I have found that this term is used specifically of a woman. 
Every other time, it's not regarding woman, it's regarding man, or it's regarding agriculture. But this time, God specifically says, your offspring and her offspring. Okay? He doesn't say between the offspring of the serpent and the offspring of mankind. This is significant. Why? Why is this significant? Flip with me over to Matthew. Actually, let's go to Luke first. We'll, we'll come back to Matthew in a second. We'll go to Luke. So we're in Luke chapter 1. <coughs> verse 26. In the sixth month, the sixth month of what? Does anybody know what the sixth month refers to there? Elizabeth. Yeah, Elizabeth. Yeah, because you've you got to remember, all these little breaks that we have in our Bible, you know, with the little titles and things, those weren't in the original writings, okay? Neither were the numbers, Maybe, you know, chapter and verse. They, those, were, those were put in there for our convenience, so I could tell you guys how to get to the same place I am. It's kind of a cheat, because it used to be you just memorized it all, and when I started quoting something, you would know exactly where I was. You know, we're lazy. So we put chapters and verses in there. But we just finished with Elizabeth conceiving John. So when they say in the sixth month, it's referring specifically to her pregnancy. Just back up a couple verses and you'll see what they're referring to, okay? In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. Now, I'm going to stop here for just a second. Virgin. Okay? Had never been with a man. Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. See, we like to deal with these things with glitter and gold and lights and trees, and stockings, and fat dudes in red suits. But really, we should be dealing with this thing all year round. Right? Just like, you know, Easter, Resurrection Sunday, should not be associated with bunnies and colored eggs. Yeah, we do, but all year round, we should be cognizant of these things. We should be aware of these things. Because this is the base on which our faith rests. Okay? So, behold, the virgin shall conceive. So here we are in the sixth month. She's a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. Now, we don't really have betrothed in our society. Not the way that they did. Because to the way the Jewish custom worked was when a family agreed that their children would be married. They would come together, the fathers would work out the agreement, or sometimes the, the wife or the, the girl's father would work out the agreement with what would be the husband. And once they made an agreement, um, they were considered married. Okay? They were married. But they weren't united until the union was complete. The union could not be complete until the husband had gone and prepared a house, prepared a place for her to live, and then would come and announce that the preparations were complete and the marriage could commence, could begin. This, this ceremony where the joining of the two would actually occur. Okay? Now, it goes even beyond that. It goes into things that we as Americans get uncomfortable with. Because the best man had very different responsibilities than our best man did. 
Because see, once they were united, the husband and wife, before the party started, would adjourn to the new house. To commune together. And the best man's job was to stand outside the door until the groom said, It's done! We are now one. And then he would turn around and he would announce to all the party who was still waiting there to begin the celebration, it's done! It's officially won! But see, this word betrothed, they were married, but the deed was not done. Joseph was still in the process of putting the household together. He was preparing a place with which he would then go and get his wife and bring her back. See, that's where we are. You understand that? Jesus used the same illustration, something that was commonly understood to them, and said, I am going to my father's house. I'm preparing a place with many mansions. When it is done, I will come back for you. And what's the first thing we do? We have intimate communion with our sovereign creator and the party begins. Do you understand that? Do you understand that this illustration right here is what God desires of us? We look at it backwards, folks. We look at marriage and say, oh, this is a good illustration of our relationship with God. God said, no! I gave you marriage as the illustration. This is what we are supposed to have, and that illustrates this. Not the reverse. Okay? That's the intimacy that God longs to have with us, that He desires, that He wants. That openness, that complete and absolute trust. So, they're betrothed, they're married. But she has not yet come into his house. The virgin's name was Mary. And he, the, the angel Gabriel, came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. <coughs> but she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now, Mary, being very logical, says, uh, one, one question. Still a virgin. How can this happen? How, how can this happen? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. You guys, if that doesn't get you excited, I don't know what will. Do you understand what is happening here, what the angel is telling her? God Almighty is going to do something that has never been done before and will never be done again. He is going to join together <coughs> all God and all man and create a unique being. Something never before seen. Why? Why? Why did he have to do this? I mean, he just did. We're not talking about a miraculous birth here. That doesn't cover it. John's is a miraculous birth. Samuel had a miraculous birth. Their mothers were barren. And God made a miracle in which they were able to conceive. But they conceived naturally. God changed their bodies so they could conceive naturally. That's still a miraculous birth. This is so far beyond it, it doesn't even compare. God has done a miracle of a magnitude far greater than John's that we can't even conceive it, really. God has created the God-man, Jesus Christ. 
God incarnate, fully God, fully man. Now, one of the things I want to draw out to you, this is just, just something that, that I think we overlook all too often, okay? Split back to Matthew, chapter 1. You guys think God knew what he was doing? <coughs> you think God knew what he was doing when he chose Mary? Then it would follow that God knew what he was doing when he chose Joseph as well. Right? But look at this. Chapter 1, verse 19. Actually, I'll start up in 18. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Okay, we just covered all of that. But did you notice what wasn't covered in the whole interchange there? Joseph was not covered in this. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Now we look at that and go, oh, dude, you blew it. Really? What was Joseph's right? As a matter of fact, what was the just requirement of the law if he found out that the woman that he was betrothed to was pregnant and he was not the father? That's right. It would be his responsibility to take her outside the city gates and throw the first rock. But he was a just man, and I love this line, unwilling to put her to shame. Unwilling. Unwilling. Proverbs says something about a wise man concealing shame. Right. Remember? All too often when somebody does us an offense, what do we want to do? We want to let the world know about it. We want to climb up on the roof and crow. Look at the dirt they did me. Disgusting people. Hate them like I hate them. Therefore, I will be justified. But Joseph doesn't do that. Can you imagine the hurt he must have felt? Because up to this point, he has no clue what's going on. We don't have any indication even that Mary told him. Can you imagine the hurt he must have felt? But as he considered these things, before, <coughs> an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And Joseph, when Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until the until she had given birth to a son, and he, he, and he called his name Jesus. <clears throat> Folks, Joseph is one of those great men in Scripture that we just overlook. If God trusted Mary to carry his son and mother his son, how much more did he trust Joseph? the father his son. Mary had a connection. We know from Genesis. It was her seed. It was her seed. Mothers have that connection. When the babies are born, you know, I was there for all five of our babies being born. And I never had the connection Christy did. Most of it was like, could you wash that thing? <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> Clean it up and make it look human. <laughs> Wrap it in a blanket. So Mary had a connection. What did Joseph have? Sleep. 
See, God didn't leave Joseph holding the bag. He didn't leave Mary holding the bag. Because how awful could it have been if God didn't speak to Joseph? God had both of their backs. And he came and spoke to them and told them, this is my plan. And he didn't just tell them, this is my plan, go with it. He said, this is my plan and this is what I'm going to accomplish with it. See this? He says, he will save his people from their sins. There's two things I want to draw your attention to. One, his people. Who are his people? What? Now the first reaction would be the Jews. But that's not what Jesus says. Those who believe he gave the right to be called the children of God. The Jews first, and then the Gentiles. But all of them, he has given the right to be called the children of God. Okay? He will save his people from their sins. Now, even that, that phrase right there, from their sins. Can you imagine how staggering that must have been to them? So what, he's going to become a high priest and slaughter the lambs and the goats and the ox and the cows and the doves and the pigeons and um, God for not three bites. We messed up. No, that, that, that's not what he's doing. God is revealing his plan to Mary and Joseph. And, and you know what? I, I think they misunderstood. I, I think that at some point along the way they were thinking that Jesus was going to walk into Jerusalem and park his rump on David's throne. I think they were looking for a physical Messiah. We, we see later when Jesus enters his ministry, we see Mary and some of her other sons and, and daughters coming and they're trying to pull Jesus out and they're afraid for him. Why are they afraid? Because he's saying things like, I am God! Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Come home, let me make you a nice matzo. <laughs> they, they, they didn't get it. They're trying to bring him to what they think is safety. She's doing the mom thing. And she's doing it wrong. Because that's not what God is wanting. But we know at some point they came around. Because at the end of things, when Jesus was on the cross, where was Mary? At the cross. At the cross. At the cross. A believer. We know that some of his brothers came around. We have their writings. James and Jude. So we know that at some point they went from not believing or believing some mistaken thing to knowing the truth. Can you imagine having Jesus as an older brother? <coughs> Mom always did like you best. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, you can't answer that without a lie without going, you're right. He never made a mistake. <clears throat> so we see in Genesis, <coughs> excuse me, we see a promise right there amidst the curse. There is going to be of woman's seed, of a virgin. Man is not going to be involved. There is going to come one. We also see that it's singular. The word used for seed is singular. He's not talking about all the seed that comes after. He's talking about one. And this seed will bruise the serpent's head. He's going to kick you in the head, devil. Okay? So we see the promise. We see in Isaiah, the promise is, is further clarified. We're not, even, we're not having to um, investigate into the, the words and the roots and the usage. Isaiah makes it very clear. The virgin will conceive. Now, those two words can't go together naturally. They have to go together supernaturally. 
in order for her to still be a virgin and have conceived. Then God gives a promise to Mary. And he says, Mary, this is what I'm going to do. The Spirit is going to come upon you. You will conceive the incarnate God. You have found favor, Mary. And then he speaks to Joseph. And says, Joseph, don't worry. This is my plan. I have this. I am doing this. Don't be afraid to take her to be your wife. One more passage I want to read to you. Okay. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. I love this passage. You don't have to turn there. Don't, don't worry about it. It's just a, a little bit that I want to read. It says, Paul is writing, he says, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. I love that passage because the idea that we get there is God was waiting, waiting for the right time. God had chosen a time and he's just watching the clock. Now! And it happened. See, God was not caught off guard. God is never caught off guard. God wasn't surprised in the garden when he showed up and Adam is walking around. I hope he was walking around with poison oak. <laughs> we know he wasn't because there was no poison oak in the garden. That came as a result of what he did. But I sure would like to think of that. <laughs> Even in what God did then, he showed his favor because the first sacrifice was committed there. And God filled animals to cover them with skins. A foreshadow of what was to come. Okay. When the time had fully come, God sent his son. Born of a woman. Now just a couple things I want to address real quick. We have to understand first the Incarnation. He's fully God, fully man. You have to understand that this is the only way that a perfect, sinless sacrifice could be arrived at. Okay? That's the only way. This is why this is critical to our understanding. This is essential to our faith. There is no other way we could have had a perfect, sinless, completely righteous Sacrifice that would take away our sins. Okay? <clears throat> good enough was not good enough. It had to be perfect. Why? Because God is perfect. And the righteousness that He gives us is absolutely perfect. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the enemy will come to you and say, Oh, you're struggling with this again. Mm. Not good enough. Not good enough. You're never going to be good enough. To which we respond, Absolutely, I will never be good enough. That's why Jesus was. Okay? He was good enough. He was more than good enough. He was so good that His grace exceeds my sin. Father, we bless you today. We thank you, Father, for the miracle of the virgin birth. Lord God, that your Son, absolutely God and absolutely man, came and took my place. I thank you, Father, for this miracle. Miracle of miracles. Lord God, that this was not just a beyond normal event. It was supernatural. We bless you today, Father, and we thank you. I ask that you would help us, Father, to grasp these truths, that you would plant them <coughs> in our hearts and our minds. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.